Hi, my name is Brendan Hayes, and I'm the Director of Education for Innovative Therapies at NHF. Welcome to Gene Therapy Getting Up to Speed. I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Mark Redding. He's the Director of the Center for Bleeding and Clotting Disorders at the University of Minnesota Medical Center. Now, to get the most from this session, first off, I want to let you guys know that this session has been pre-recorded. So please use the chat box to write in questions or comments. The speaker will be responding to the chat throughout the session. Make sure to give any additional feedback at the very end of the session by filling out the evaluation. And I'll check back in with you at the end of the session to, to help you understand how to do that. And then finally, all of our presentations are gonna be recorded and they're gonna be available to watch online. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Redding. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, uh, hello to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today and to participate in this program. Here are my disclosures. Okay, so here's an outline of what we're going to cover uh, in our time today. We'll first start out by talking about what is gene therapy. Next, we'll spend some time reviewing why gene therapy is something that we're pursuing for hemophilia. In the middle, I'd like to spend some time reviewing with you the history of gene therapy, talk about where this started, uh, some of the things that have happened along the way that have informed uh, our ability to understand how this technology works, some of the hurdles that we had to get through to bring us to where we are today. Next, we'll talk about how gene therapy for hemophilia specifically works. At the end, we'll talk about challenges and unanswered questions that need to be solved in order for us to bring this therapy to a, re a reality. So first, what is gene therapy? The concept of gene therapy is, is actually very simple. The concept is that gene therapy attempts to treat a disease at its origin at the molecular level. So the idea here is that if you have a disease or a medical condition that's caused by a broken gene, if there was some way that we could fix that gene, then we should be able to cure the disease. And of course, the question is then, how do we actually fix the gene? And that is, that is really the crux of gene therapy. So there are a variety of mechanisms by which we can fix broken genes. Um, I'll talk about three of them today, and we'll focus, of course, on the one that we're using for hemophilia. But just to review the others first, there's a technology called gene editing. Many of you have probably heard of the term CRISPR, which is one of several gene editing technologies that are being developed. The idea here is that we use various uh, technologies to actually go in and repair or replace a broken gene itself inside the body. Another technology is called cell therapy. This one is also sometimes called ex vivo gene therapy. And probably the most common example of this is a, a new treatment called CAR T therapy. So the idea here is that we take cells out of the patient's body, genetically modify those cells, expand those cells into larger numbers in the laboratory, and then we infuse those cells back into the patient. And so all of the genetic manipulation of the cells occurs outside of the body. There are some reasons why that is potentially advantageous uh, because any of the things that we're doing to modify those cells would be happening outside of the body. The idea is that that would potentially reduce some of the risks to the patient. Um, obviously, this requires a lot of technology and the facilities to be able to do this, um, and it is being used for certain diseases. Primarily right now, it's being used to treat certain types of malignancies like leukemias. And that brings us to the third basic technology, which is gene transfer, or sometimes called vector-based gene therapy. This is the technology that we're using for hemophilia. So all of the current hemophilia gene therapy protocols and studies are using this gene transfer method. The idea here is that we infuse into the individual um, a, a vector, which is uh, something we're going to talk a lot more detail about later on, um, but that vector contains the the normally functioning gene that we want to get into the body. This is given by an intravenous infusion. Uh, that vector then travels uh, to wherever we want it to. In this case, it's the liver. Um, that vector gets inside the liver, delivers the gene, and the liver then starts to produce the protein that we want it to produce, which in this case would be factor eight or factor nine. So again, all these technologies are being developed right now, but it's this gene transfer or vector-based gene therapy that we're focusing on in hemophilia today. Okay, before we get too much further into this, I, I wanna just take a brief diversion and talk about the difference between somatic versus germline gene therapy. And this is a really important, uh, fairly minor point, but it's very important for hemophilia. 
So somatic cell gene therapy targets cells that do not produce eggs and sperm, for example, liver cells. If you do gene therapy this way, it's only going to affect or benefit the individual being treated. On the other hand, germline cell gene therapy targets cells that produce eggs and sperm. And so if you do gene therapy through that mechanism, not only are you going to be affecting the cells of the individual being treated, but those cells also can be passed on to offspring. Now with hemophilia gene therapy, we're targeting somatic cells because we're targeting the liver. And so again, this will benefit the individual who receives gene therapy. But what's really important for hemophilia is that an individual with hemophilia who goes through gene therapy, if that's successful, they will still be able to pass on the hemophilia gene to their offspring. And this is really an important thing to remember. Okay, before we get much further into this, I guess we better really back up and talk about what is a gene. So this is a, a cartoon that illustrates that. And um, if we kind of start from the beginning, so we start at the level of the cell. Estimates are that there's over 30 trillion cells in the human body, which is an amazing number to think about. Most of the cells in our body have a nucleus, which is a structure in the center part of the cell, which contains our genetic material. That genetic material is stored on structures called chromosomes. Chromosomes are made up of DNA, which we'll come to in a minute. We all have 23 pairs of chromosomes in our cells. You get one pair from each of your parents. Again, those chromosomes are made up of DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA is made of four individual components called nucleotide bases. And these are arranged in a very precise order, which essentially spells out your genetic code, much as though the words in a textbook would spell out the information being communicated. So really a gene is just a segment of that DNA. We estimate that there are between 20,000 and 25,000 genes in every one of us. These genes range in size from a few hundred of these nucleotide base pairs to more than two million nucleotide base pairs. So they range in size from pretty small to really pretty big. Each individual gene then provides the instructions for a cell in your body to produce a specific protein like factor eight or factor nine. So why is hemophilia such a good target for gene therapy? And this is a list of some of the features of hemophilia that make it particularly attractive as a target for gene therapy. So first of all, hemophilia A and hemophilia B are what we call monogenetic diseases. That means that they're caused by a single specific genetic defect. Secondly, the clinical manifestations of hemophilia are due to a single missing protein. So this isn't something like cancer, uh, which is caused by many different genetic uh, problems or other diseases like cardiovascular disease, uh, for example, where we can't just fix one gene or fix one protein and, and fix the disease. Uh, hemophilia, because of genetic and because all of the clinical manifestations are due to a single problem, uh, um, gene therapy then would be a, a real good way uh, of The third point is that we don't have to fix it all the way. In other words, a modest increase in the factor eight or factor nine level can really have a dramatic impact on the clinical uh, course of someone with hemophilia. And so to get it to 100%, we just have to get it a little bit better than, than baseline. It's also important when we think about gene therapy for a specific disease that we have animal models to study. It's very difficult to do studies in humans, especially if it's a new technology. And we're not really sure how safe it is or how well it's going to work. Um, you know, for obvious ethical reasons, we can't really do that in humans. And so having the availability of mouse models and even larger animal models, uh, which we do have for hemophilia, that's been really a key part of, of making hemophilia for hemoph uh, excuse me, gene therapy for hemophilia uh, progress forward to where it is today. Toward the end of our list, um, another important point is that Factor eight and factor nine can be made by cells other than those that normally make them. And so that's another important concept with gene therapy where you wanna insert the corrected gene or the normally functioning gene into a cell. And that may not be the cell type that normally produces that cell, uh, produces that protein rather. And so with hemophilia, because factor eight and factor nine can be produced in all kinds of different cells, uh, that, that is one of the things that lends itself to gene therapy. And then lastly, the goal of gene therapy is to replace the missing protein, in this case, factor eight or factor nine. And so we have to have an easy way to assess for whether or not that's happening. And with hemophilia, of course, we have a very simple and, and widely available thing, which is just measuring a factor level. And then we can actually look at the patients as well and see how much they bleed. And so these, these outcomes of the treatment we're delivering being widely available and very easy to use and measure are also things that really lend themselves to gene therapy being a good fit 
for hemophilia. So I wanna just review very briefly the evolution of hemophilia treatment. And as, as you guys all know, um, this is a process that's been ongoing for many, many, many years. And you can see from this diagram, um, starting out in the early part of the 1900s, we had very uh, ineffective ways of treating hemophilia. Uh, and a lot of advances have happened along the way. I think most of us would agree that the modern era of hemophilia treatment really began with the introduction of the recombinant clotting factor concentrates in the 1990s. More recently, we've seen the development of the extended half-life factor concentrates, and then even more recently than that, we have non-factor replacement therapy. And so, um, while it's very true that hemophilia treatment options have, have significantly improved, especially in the last few years, um, we still have not quite accomplished what we really want to, uh, which is curing this disease. This next slide explains this in a little bit more detail. The graph I'm showing here um, has two panels. On the top, uh, the, the blue lines represent the degree to which one's clotting ability is corrected. So hemostasis is clotting ability. On the bottom, um, I'm showing what factor levels look like. And if we just kind of take each of these segments at a time. So with standard half-life factor concentrates, we know that every time we infuse a dose of factor, the factor level goes up. And concordant with that, the body's ability to clot goes up. But we also know that factor only lasts a certain length of time, and so we have these peaks and we have these troughs of, of factor levels and, and subsequently protection from bleeding with our standard half-life products. Now, the extended half-life products, which were first introduced in 2014, improved upon that. Extended half-life products last longer, and so we don't have to infuse quite as often. And because they last longer and we don't have to infuse quite as often, we have been able to keep the trough levels a bit higher to provide better protection from bleeds. But this still requires uh, relatively frequent intravenous infusions given over one's lifetime. Turning to the non-factor therapy options, there's only one of these currently available. Um, this is a drug that doesn't increase the factor level itself. So you see down there at the bottom, the factor level really isn't changing from baseline. But this drug affects the clotting system in other ways, and so the ability of the body to clot or hemostatic ability is improved. With this technology or with this therapy, we get rid of the peaks and troughs, um, and we replace that with more of an ongoing continuous correction of the clotting deficit. But as you can see from the diagram, it doesn't really fix it to normal. It kind of gives constant low-level bleed protection, uh, which for some people is, is a great advance, but it really doesn't achieve what we're looking for uh, which is getting those levels into the normal range always. So people on non-factor replacement therapies still can have breakthrough bleeds. There would still be the need to potentially provide factor coverage for surgery or for major trauma, things of that sort. Now turning to gene therapy, the idea here is that we somehow get the body to produce the factor level in normal amounts or near normal amounts continuously over time, and that would then continuously correct the clotting deficit and allow individuals with hemophilia to essentially live a normal life from the perspective of bleeding risk. So we have made a lot of advancements in our treatment options for hemophilia, particularly in the last six or seven years with extended half-life factor products, and now more recently with the beginnings of the non-factor replacement therapy era. But it's important to note that all of these currently available treatments still require repeated injections. Certainly with the non-factor therapy products, we've seen the advance of having to do subcutaneous injections or under the skin injections rather than intravenous injections. But it's still true to say that these drugs all require repeated injections over one's lifetime in order to treat hemophilia. In addition, and I think more importantly, the real goal that we're all after is zero bleeds. And even though the, the advances in the drug options for hemophilia have, have been big steps forward, we still really haven't truly achieved that goal of zero bleeds. And so what we really want with gene therapy, the hope and the promise of gene therapy for hemophilia is that we really can achieve a true cure. Okay, let's spend some time talking about the history of gene therapy, not just for hemophilia, but, but in general. So I think you can break this down into four basic time frames. So we have the 1970s through the 1990s where a lot of preclinical development was going on. Preclinical means that we're not doing this in humans. We're doing this in the lab and we're doing this in animal models. Starting in the mid-1990s, we saw the first wave of clinical trials for hemophilia gene therapy and other gene therapies for other diseases in humans. Uh, we, we ran into some bumps in the road, and I'll talk about a couple of those in just a moment. 
Uh, this led to a period of pause in gene therapy activity around the world, while more preclinical studies were done to try to understand some of the things that didn't go well. Uh, by the time we got to 2010, things really started to advance rapidly, especially in hemophilia. We saw the first really successful gene therapy trial in hemophilia, and I'll talk to you about that in some more detail in a couple of slides. And then at the end, we have where we are now, which really, just in the last five or six years, things have ramped up very, very quickly, and so we'll spend some time talking about that as well. So first, thinking about the 1970s to the 1990s, you know, gene therapy was first considered as a treatment approach as early as 1972. There was a paper published in the journal called Science, which described this concept that I reviewed at the very beginning, which is if you have a disease caused by a broken gene, if you could fix that gene, you could potentially cure that disease. And so we've thought about the concept of gene therapy for a very long time, but we didn't really have the technology back then in order to do anything with that idea. In the early 1980s, the factor eight and the factor nine gene were identified. They were sequenced and they were cloned. This gave us the ability to actually make corrected genes for uh, missing proteins like hemophilia A and hemophilia B, factor eight and factor nine. Also during this time, there was a rapid development of animal models, uh, both small animal models like mice and larger animals like dogs and, and non-human primates like monkeys. And so those animal models, as I mentioned before, are a very important tool that we need in order to develop a new technology and make sure it's safe to use in humans. The first animal studies for gene therapy started in the early 1990s. So turning now to the first attempts to do this in humans. The first attempts in hemophilia were done with factor nine. And the reason for this is the factor nine gene is much smaller than the factor eight gene. And back then we didn't have the technology to get the factor eight gene inside the delivery vehicles for gene therapy. I'll talk about that in some more detail in just a little bit. Um, in order to get factor eight genes small enough to fit inside the delivery vehicles, there were some additional modifications that had to be made, and that's not something that we had the ability to do at the beginning, that came around a few years later. Now, the initial uh, uh, gene therapy trials for hemophilia starting in the mid-1990s, the success of those was limited by a couple of things. Um, the immune response against the gene therapy that was delivered was a big problem, and this resulted in the factor levels not going up very high and not sticking around very long. So those first few patients that were treated really had just very transient, uh, low-level expression of, of factor IX in this case. Uh, and so it really wasn't uh, what we were hoping for, but at least it gave us a glimpse that we could potentially get this to work if we could just get over some of those hurdles. I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about um, some unfortunate events that happened in gene therapy. Um, th fortunately, this was not in hemophilia gene therapy, uh, but what happened in these other diseases uh, where gene therapy was being developed was really important in terms of us understanding how to make hemophilia gene therapy and all gene therapy uh, a more safe treatment option for our patients. So the first story I want to tell you is about a young man named Jesse Gelsinger. Uh, Jesse was an 18-year-old man who had a disease called ornithine transcarboxylase deficiency. It's a very long-sounding uh, uh, disease. This is a problem where you're missing an enzyme in your liver, uh, which helps to break down protein. Um, now, most people with this disease die uh, in infancy. It's a, a fatal disease uh, in the first few months of life, but Jesse had a milder form of this, and so he was able to, to live um, into his teenage years and become a young adult. Um, by a combination of a lot of medications and following a very special diet. <clears throat> but this was, of course, very, very hard for him. And so um, they were looking for ways to correct this, uh, this enzyme deficiency, and an adenovirus-based gene therapy strategy was developed. I'll talk more about what that really means in a minute. So unfortunately, Jesse was the first human to receive this, and um, four days after receiving the infusion of the gene therapy, uh, he died. Uh, due to a very severe immune reaction, which caused all of his organs to shut down. And this was, this was obviously a tragedy. This was a, a functioning uh, young man who volunteered for this study um, and, and obviously had a very unfortunate outcome. And I think the thing that really um, got our attention was not the fact that he died necessarily, but the fact that this was totally unexpected. Um, based on what we understood uh, from the animal models, we did not really expect to see this, this really severe immune response. And so this certainly... Uh, caught everyone's attention. Another thing I want to bring your attention to is, uh, again, another unfortunate tragedy. Uh, this uh, was a different disease that was being treated with a different type of gene therapy. Uh, the disease in this case is X-linked severe combined immunodeficiency. 
Uh, these are children that are born uh, basically without any immune system at all, and there are ver a variety of forms of that. There's one form that's um, uh, due to a problem with a gene on the X chromosome, like hemophilia is, because uh, it's coincidentally. Um, and so they had developed a retroviral-based gene therapy strategy for that. And, and again, I'll talk about what these viruses mean here in just a few minutes. But this particular gene therapy strategy didn't have the same immune uh, response problems that we saw with, uh, with the previous uh, experience I described. But unfortunately, when a retrovirus delivers its gene therapy, it sometimes inserts the gene into a place we don't want it. And what happened here is that they had a cohort of 11 children in France where the study was being performed uh, who received this gene therapy treatment uh, for their severe immune deficiency. And two of those 11 children unfortunately developed leukemia as a consequence of the way the gene therapy uh, inserted itself into those patients' uh, chromosomes. And those children unfortunately died of those leukemias. And so these two really big uh, uh, setbacks in the early gene therapy experience for humans um, put, a, put a hold on all gene therapy trials for a few years. Um, this led to uh, basically back to the drawing board. So going back to the lab, back to the animal models, back to those preclinical studies to try to better understand not only this immune response problem that Jesse Gelsinger suffered from, but also safer ways to deliver gene therapy um, so that it doesn't uh, uh, cause things like leukemia, for example. So this went on for a number of years. And in fact, it's still ongoing. But during, the, during that time uh, between these initial attempts uh, and the early 2000s, a lot of progress was made and then we get to the third phase of, of the history of gene therapy, which really starts in about 2010. Uh, a major step forward was announced by a, 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 a team of researchers working at St. Jude Children's Hospital here in the US and also University College in London. Um, what they did is they used a new way of delivering gene therapy called AAV or adeno-associated virus. And I'll explain what that is in just a little bit. Um, this got around some of that, uh, some of those issues that we saw in the first wave of clinical trials where we had horrible immune responses and we had uh, the potential for triggering development of leukemia. Uh, so this new way of doing gene therapy was born out of all those back to the drawing board kinds of studies that were done uh, after the, the first experience didn't go the way we wanted it to. So they had 10 subjects with hemophilia B that were treated with this new AAV mediated factor IX gene therapy protocol. And not only did they achieve higher factor levels, but they were sustained over time. So the factor levels were certainly not normal, but they were high enough that these individuals did not need to continue using factor. And the initial reports came out after one year, they were still having uh, measurable factor levels, and then it was two years, and then three years, and, and now we're coming on 10 years since some of these initial uh, individuals were treated and they still have measurable factor levels. So this was really the sort of the proof of concept that yes, we can actually get gene therapy to work and to be safe and to last for more than a few weeks. And that brings us to where we are now. Starting in 2014, uh, uh, more, once, once we showed this proof of concept, many more clinical trials very rapidly got started. Uh, in 2015, the first AAV-mediated factor eight gene therapy trial was started. Uh, the first reports of the outcome of that trial were reported in 2017. And similar to what we saw with hemophilia B, as I just described, we saw sustained factor levels, factor eight levels um, at two years, and now a more recent report from just a month or so ago uh, has shown that some of those patients still have really good factor levels, even out to four years. And so, again, we've gotten over that initial hurdle of, of getting this to last at least for uh, time frame in years. In 2017, the first gene therapy treatment was approved in the U.S., not for hemophilia, but for a genetic eye condition that leads to blindness. A couple of years beyond that, in 2019, so just last year, uh, the second gene therapy treatment uh, was approved in the U.S., uh, again, not for hemophilia, but for a condition called spinal muscular atrophy. So we right now have two FDA-approved gene therapy treatments in the U.S. for diseases other than hemophilia. And, of course, here we are in 2020. Um, as, as you probably heard, there's a lot of excitement about uh, a gene therapy for hemophilia A that is very likely to be approved in the near future. Whether that happens this year or early next year, I think we're not quite sure. Um, but uh, it's very likely that in the very near future, we will have the first approved gene therapy for hemophilia in the US. Currently, there are 27 active gene therapy trials ongoing. If you go to this website called clinicaltrials.gov, you can look at all of those. And so really right now, we're experiencing a wave of clinical trial activity, bringing gene therapy from where it started in the 1970s, 1990s, where we are now in the 2000, 
teens and 20s. So we've really made a lot of progress in, in a very short period of time. Okay, so as we kind of get toward the last part of, of the program today, I want to just focus now on hemophilia gene therapy. So I want to walk you through how does that really work. And there are five basic steps to this. The first step is to design a working gene. The second step is to design a way to transport that working gene into the body. Next, we have to figure out who's eligible for this. The fourth step is to actually get the gene into the body. And then the last step is to monitor the patients to see if this works and to make sure that it's safe. So let's talk about each one of these steps briefly uh, individually. So the first step is to design a working gene. And I don't have time to get into all the details of how we do this, but suffice it to say that we have the ability in the lab um, to take a, fact, a normal factor eight or a normal factor nine gene uh, and create what we call a transgene construct. So um, for factor nine, we use the, what we call the wild type factor nine gene. That's just a normal factor nine gene. Or they're also in some studies using a thing called factor nine Padua. Uh, this is a, a specific mutation in factor nine which causes it to function uh, more than normal. In other words, individuals with this particular factor nine mutation actually have levels of factor nine that are several hundred percent rather than a hundred percent. Um, uh, these family, this family was first uh, described in, in Padua, Italy, which is why the, the mutation has that name. And so uh, those are the, the, the genes being used in factor nine gene therapy strategies. Now for factor eight, as I mentioned earlier, the factor eight gene is much bigger than the factor nine gene. And in order to get this thing to, to fit inside um, the transport vehicle, which I'll talk about next, um, we had to, to modify the factor eight gene by removing part of it called the B domain. So the factor eight genes that we're using in gene therapy now are all B domain deleted. In addition to the normal gene for factor eight or factor nine, we also can attach some other pieces of DNA called enhancers and promoters. Uh, these are pieces of DNA that will turn on that gene in a specific cell type, like a liver cell. And they'll also give some additional information to the cell about what to do uh, in order to make the, the protein of interest, in this case, factor eight or factor nine, correctly. So when we assemble all that together in the lab, we have what we call a transgene construct. So the next thing is we have to figure out how to transport this gene into the body. And the problem here is that the body has natural defense mechanisms that prevent a working gene from just being directly introduced into the body. So we can't just squirt the, the correct gene in, we have to somehow transport it in. So the solution to that is, is the vector. And, and we, we mentioned this earlier, and I'm gonna talk in a little bit more detail about it here shortly. So the vector, um, you can think of it like a delivery truck. Um, this is um, a vehicle that not only protects the gene from those body's natural defenses, but also has the ability to deliver it specifically to the intended target, which in this case is the liver. And so with these, uh, these vectors, we've gotten over this, this problem of the natural defense mechanisms and the solution that then allows us to have gene therapy be successful. So let's talk about these vectors. So we're using viral vectors. Now, as I mentioned, in the first wave of clinical trials, they used adenoviral vectors and retroviral vectors, and we saw some serious consequences or problems with those. Um, but why are we using viruses is really the question. So first of all, I guess, what is a virus? A virus is a small piece of DNA or mRNA, excuse me, RNA, uh, enclosed in a protein coat or a capsid, and sometimes those are further enclosed in a lipid envelope. Why we use viruses for gene therapy is because viruses are really, really, really good at getting into the body and delivering their genetic material into cells. And so this, this provides sort of a naturally occurring ideal transport vehicle if we could figure out a way to do it uh, with a virus that won't make us sick. And that's where we get to the adeno-associated viruses, or AAV. These are naturally occurring viruses that do not cause disease in humans. They also don't have the ability to replicate or, or multiply and divide on their own. And so they're a fairly safe type of virus in terms of introducing into the body. There are several different serotypes, and, and these serotypes are numbered one through nine. There's at least nine of these. Um, and the difference is they have different proteins in that capsid, that, that coat that surrounds the DNA has a slightly different look to it, and that's what, what the different serotypes are all about. Another important feature of the adeno-associated virus is that they're what we call non-integrating. In other words, they insert their DNA into the cell nucleus, but not into the actual DNA of the host, uh, or in this case, the patient. Um, and that helps uh, in terms of some of the safety issues that we saw with those early attempts at gene therapy. And so if you take an empty AAV viral capsid and you insert our transgene construct, you've then created a therapeutic vector that can be administered to patients in hemophilia gene therapy. 
So next we have to figure out who's eligible. We've got our working gene, we've got our transport vehicle, who are we gonna do this in? And this slide shows you um, the basic inclusion and exclusion criteria uh, for the clinical trials in, in hemophilia gene therapy that have been done thus far. So in general, these are all uh, males over age 18 with severe hemophilia A or hemophilia B. Um, they've all had a lot of previous factor exposure and importantly, no history of inhibitors to factor eight or factor nine. Um, one of the exclusion criteria, and we'll talk about this in, in a few minutes, but some people have antibodies against these AAV serotypes. And if you have those antibodies, uh, if we try to administer that to you, those antibodies will neutralize the vector and make it not work. And so that's an exclusion criteria. Uh, also, um, in the studies that have been done thus far, we, you have to have a healthy liver. And we know that many of our older hemophilia patients, because of viral hepatitis, uh, maybe don't have the healthiest of livers. And so those, those are exclusion criteria. Uh, and HIV in some studies has been an exclusion criteria as well, unless it's under very good control. So thinking about it from this perspective, if we look at everyone with severe hemophilia who at least theoretically would be eligible for gene therapy, but then we take into consideration uh, who has been excluded and who has been included in the clinical trials thus far, it's only been done in people who don't have a history of inhibitor, only in adults with healthy livers, and who don't have antibodies to the vector. And so if we think about it from that perspective, right now we've only shown that it's safe and effective to do hemophilia gene therapy in a fairly small proportion of the overall hemophilia population. And so we have a lot of work to do in order to be able to expand this to potentially everybody with hemophilia. So the next step is to actually place this thing into the body, and we could again spend a lot of time talking about this, but to just kind of show you an example of how this works, so this is a, a bigger picture of that slide I showed at, at the beginning, we were talking about the three different types of uh, gene therapy strategies. So the idea here is we take that therapeutic vector, that AAV vector, uh, which contains the, the working factor eight or factor nine gene, we really just infuse it through an intravenous infusion uh, into, the, into a peripheral vein. Uh, these viral particles get into the liver because that's where they're targeted. Um, they insert their DNA into the liver cells, and the liver cells then start to produce factor eight or factor nine. So it's a very simple process to get this into the body. This next picture is a much more complicated uh, figure uh, for those of you who are more interested in the, in the nitty-gritty details of how this works. Again, it just shows the, uh, the AAV vector with the, with the working gene going from outside the body to inside the body. Uh, that viral particle then finds its way to the liver, uh, gets into a liver cell, gets into the cell nucleus, delivers its DNA, uh, and again, the DNA doesn't get into the chromosomes of the patient. The DNA stays in the nucleus, but sort of outside the chromosomes, uh, and then it sets up camp and tells the cell to produce factor eight or factor nine. So it's really a very uh, slick process, uh, but also very elegant and very complex process biologically. After we've done that, then the last part is to monitor for safety and efficacy. So the current clinical trials going on plan for about a five-year follow-up, but really it's unclear how long we'll need to follow individuals who've had gene therapy. We think it's probably a lot longer than five years if we're really gonna understand everything that is to come. Um, I think one of the most important things is we have to figure out how are we gonna keep track of all these individuals. Gene therapy isn't gonna just happen in one country. Um, it'll probably happen in lots of different countries. And so in any individual country, the number of patients treated, especially with the considerations that we just reviewed, may be relatively small. And so we're gonna need to figure out ways to work together and to keep track of all these patients. And our real goal is to have a robust international database where all the information uh, from people who've received gene therapy can be, can be collected. Uh, and from that uh, international database, then we have a much larger uh, set of information from which we can learn uh, all of the things that we need to know to make this a safe option for everyone. So what are some of the challenges and some of the unanswered questions? The first big challenge is immune responses, and we touched on this earlier. There are two types of immune responses. Uh, one type is that you have pre-existing anti-AAV anti antibodies. So this AAV virus is a naturally occurring virus. A lot of us have been exposed to it uh, in, in childhood. And so you may have antibodies against the particular capsid uh, that, that is part of that therapeutic vector. Um, whether or not you have antibodies depends a little bit on which serotype or which specific type of uh, AAV capsid we use. And also there's some geographic variation, but overall about 20 to 40% uh, 
of the population is going to have these pre-existing antibodies. And so that would preclude the use of that particular gene therapy strategy for that individual. Now, there are a variety of solutions which have been proposed to try to get around this, and, and maybe in the interest of time, I won't go through those individually. Uh, but suffice it to say, even though we've got a lot of good ideas about how we might get around this, this is still a major barrier uh, in gene therapy today. We haven't quite figured out how to get around this issue, but we're actively working on that. A second type of immune response is against the transduced cell. A transduced cell is a cell in which the gene therapy vector has delivered its DNA. So in this case, it's the liver cells. And we see liver enzyme elevations as a marker of an immune response against those liver cells that have been modified by gene therapy. These are actually very common. Um, generally, in the clinical trials thus far, these have been managed successfully with prednisone, which is a drug to sort of suppress the immune system. However, we don't yet know the optimal way to do this. We don't know the optimal regimen, uh, and, and all of that's going to need to get defined a lot more clearly in, in order for us to feel really confident that we've got this one handled. Another thing that's been a bit of a concern in the clinical trials thus far is that this doesn't happen in everyone and doesn't happen to the same degree in everyone. So some subjects have required repeated and or prolonged courses of immune suppression. Some have needed to use drugs beyond prednisone to get this to, to sort of come under control. And so we have a whole lot of work to do to figure this out. Uh, we also don't know why this is a bigger problem for some people who've received gene therapy and not for others. And so again, this is one of the biggest unanswered questions and challenges facing us going forward. Here's a list of a few others. Um, so we also know that this, this doesn't work in everybody. So if you look at the clinical trial experience thus far, we've seen some patients with normal factor levels, but others, although the, the level may be better than baseline, is still less than 10%. There's a wide range of, of, of how high the factor level goes in a given individual. And again, we haven't really figured out yet how to tell ahead of time whether it's going to work really well or sort of well in an individual. Another big question is, can we expand gene therapy to those individuals who have not been included in the clinical trials um, so that we can make this available to everyone, not just a select subset? And those are, again, unanswered questions about safety uh, in people with, for example, pre-existing liver disease. Another challenge facing us is we don't know how long this is going to last. Um, how long will the factor levels stay up? Will they decrease over time? We've seen um, in the clinical trials uh, thus far, there does seem to be a, a, a tapering down of the factor level over time. In, in some studies, that's been linked to these immune responses that we talked about. Um, it's not clear yet whether that will continue to slowly decrease uh, and eventually go back down to baseline or whether it might level off at some lower level than it was initially. Um, and again, just you need more time and more follow-up in order to answer those questions. Um, I mentioned before this issue about the preformed antibodies to AV. Um, right now, based on our current technology, we cannot redose with the same vector. And so um, if you get a gene therapy treatment and it doesn't work very well, or if it goes away over time, right now we can't just do it again. Uh, we'd, have to, we'd have to use a different vector system, and so that's another big challenge. Of course, the long-term toxicity, uh, are there issues with the liver, even though we have medicines like prednisone and other immunosuppressants, which can uh, sort of tamp down that immune response? Um, is there potential damage to the liver that will show up down the road? Uh, we don't know that yet. Um, we also don't know about other long-term toxicities, and this is why it's so important for us to be able to follow individuals who receive gene therapy, not just in clinical trials, but even if gene therapy becomes approved, we still are going to have a lot to learn, and so we're going to need to keep track of those individuals over a very long period of time to answer those questions about long-term toxicity. And then last, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention at least this, this issue, which is how much is this going to cost and how are we going to pay for it? And that's a, a discussion for, for a whole separate uh, lecture probably, uh, but I think it's an important thing to call out. Um, uh, obviously, this is very, very different than any of the other treatments we've had for hemophilia. Uh, and although we do have a couple of gene therapy options for other diseases that have been approved, um, there are a lot of unique features with regard to hemophilia that make some of these questions about the financial aspect of this important ones to sort out as well. And so in closing, um, I think it's safe to say we've made great progress toward making gene therapy for hemophilia a clinical reality. Um, I think it's, it's, it's almost certain that this will be an option in the very near future, at least for some individuals. But we also have a lot of work to be done, a lot of problems yet to be solved, and a lot of questions yet to be answered before gene therapy for hemophilia will really be a clinical reality for all those with hemophilia. So I'd like to thank you for your attention today, and I hope this uh, information has been, been helpful uh, and, and helped to expand your understanding of this really important and exciting technology 
for hemophilia, which is gene therapy. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Redding. That was really great. Um, I hope that you all enjoyed that as much as I did. Gene therapy is very complex. Um, one of the things that I did want to mention to you guys is that if you go out to the NHF virtual booth, we actually do have um, a, a PDF file for you that has all of the different resources that we have uh, collected from an NHF perspective. So there'll be links to all of those resources on our NHF website. And wanted to also encourage you all to fill out the session evaluation. You know, if you could take a few minutes and give us some feedback, we'd really appreciate that. Of course, our goal is to ensure that our um, BDC in 2021 will be even better than this one. Hopefully, we'll all be able to be in person as well. If you could rate the session on, you know, was it meaningful to you? Did you learn new information or a skill that you didn't have before? Um, are you able to explain gene therapy now where you may not have been before? And will you be able to use this when you, when you have those conversations? If there's anything that you can think of that you'd like to share with us on, you know, things that you'd like to learn more about, please do that as well. And then certainly any comments that you have. Again, um, thank you very much for your time. And we look forward to seeing you in 2021. Thank you.